Big Dad. I finally talked you into appearing on our future pro goalie school channel. Yeah. You're a big TV star now? No. No. Never will be. <laughs> So you got quite an interesting story growing up in Nairn, um, Ontario, really small town, and you guys made it to the big leagues of racing. So how did you get started in the, the racing? New York, and they built all the good ones, and you could just run them things, log thousands of laps. And so we took that thing and we run all over New York. Uh, we run as far down as Indiana and down as far as West Virginia and and all over and that car they knew it was there when when we run back then some tracks had 11 some were 13 inch wide some were 15 inch wide and 17 inch wide tires well 17 inch wide tires that so much rubber on the ground that when like you, when, when you'd get to the bigger than Indies I think yeah. and when you'd get into the corner you'd just burp her once and go the other direction. Well, there wasn't many cars that was capable of running that fast. So what got them pointed towards uh, NASCAR, uh, the guys in uh, Carlings were, were looking at them for, for a driver and then and Ron Ling from, from Lambeth was there and Earl and Gort and I and Ken the three of us. So when you guys finally made it to the big leagues of racing and just to sort of wrap up that section, you uh, raced at all the big tracks, Daytona 500, you guys won rookie of the year. Your time being in NASCAR, what would you say is your best memory of racing in the big leagues? Over at Irish Hills, Michigan was the first time he'd run second and won and he, he, he'd run second to Richard Petty over there and we all know Petty is one of the names. He was a decent driver, yes. <laughs> yes. It's an amazing accomplishment coming from Canada being the first non-American to win a race in NASCAR and to, to win Rookie of the Year. <laughs> being sponsored by uh, Carling, uh, a beer company, that was probably not bad for getting a good deal on beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, some of them were into drinking and some of them weren't. Like, yeah. it's, it's a mixed bag. It's like out, out in the general public, some want it and some don't want it. So. Well, they always talk about goaltending being super dangerous, but I would make the argument that being a jack man, which is what you were doing back when they had no speed limit on pit road, and you're on the outside tire change, and they're coming down that lane at 100, 110 miles an hour. Like, you know, I was afraid of the puck at times. So you must have been afraid of somebody just turning a little bit off, and like they're only six inches off your butt going down that. Well, Atlanta was the worst. It had a small, narrow pit lane there, and they always wanted you to jack facing the traffic so you'd know who hit you. But <laughs> you're supposed to be watching, you got to cover for both of your tire guys. You're watching that and you are also watching to see when they get the last nut tight to drop that side down and watching the on thing. Like after the after a pit stop like that and I'd come in, I had no idea what kind of a pit stop we had. I, you're so I, focused on what was happening. I just said, I, I'd ask him when we got back over the wall, oh, how'd that go? Run. He finished every position in the top 10 out of 20 races. So That's a pretty uh, consistent performance. Mm -hmm. It's a consistent car and a consistent driver. And, and obviously you guys preparing the car and the pit crew, that's consistency in, in any sport is something that's amazing. Now, um, I just want to transition a little bit to talk about hockey. Yeah, so, right. You've always been big in racing and you've always loved the Maple Leafs. So, you know, you, you obviously had me and my, my sister Sandy. At, at what point um, did I start bugging you to play hockey? Well, I think you were, we'd played road hockey and then Marion couldn't tighten your skates tight enough for you, but Larry Routley would take you there when, if Marion was busy. And that's basically how it, how you got your start, and then you played out the first year, and I think... I remember I could never stand up. I kept falling down all the time, and they had to keep picking me up. I, I do remember him bugging me on the team about being a bad skater. So 
that's where you thought, well, if I can't skate, I better stay in the net. Well, when it really comes down to it, skating in the net is the most important one of all positions no on question. the hockey. So in Canada, you know, like as parents that have kids, um, all parents that have kids in hockey would like to see them playing the NHL and they sometimes look for signs. So when you look back to as I was growing up and playing hockey and the, the good games, the bad games, all that other stuff, at what point did it sort of come into your mind that I might have a chance to play in the NHL? Well, I think we, you got into some of them OMHA finals where we were doing a lot of traveling by bus to the playoff games there and uh, were good and you won several big games with them guys and and then I still remember when you won that silver stick over at McMoran Arena in, uh, in, in Port Huron there. Uh, when they came out it was Humber College and they were all six foot two and here the Strath right team was just a scrambled one. You'd have Jimmy Vander Hayden, he was only a little over four feet, and them other guys six feet, and oh, it was just a variety of sizes. But the Humber was all, and uh, I think he won that one pretty good score at the end. And from then on, the scouts were watching, and I, I think that's pretty well where, where you got to go to the International League then and uh, you played well in there. I remember driving to Roanoke, Virginia. That's getting a little bit in the yeah. south. Yeah, that was the first year pro playing in the East Coast League. That, that, that was quite the place. And it's funny, back when we were playing minor hockey, I remember seeing an old program in that silver stick. The, the goalie for Grimsby was a kid named Curtis Joseph. Yeah. And at the time we didn't realize it, but he, he had a decent career. So yeah, after I played minor hockey and Junior B, I got cut a lot, and um, you remember in Junior B, I got cut several years in a row, and they would call me in the office and say, Steve, we don't got a spot for you on the team, and I remember that, and then when I went on my scholarship to Miami of Ohio, we lost a lot there too, so I remember there was a lot of stress and drama with the path. It wasn't like an easy, simple path to get up there, and I think that's likely what prepared me to ultimately play in the NHL, so let's Fast forward, so I'm playing in the minor leagues. I finally get called up to the NHL against uh, New Jersey Devils. And that night, um, were you guys listening to on the radio? Because I don't think it was a televised mm -hmm. game or, or no. I'm just waiting for the call. Or we were actually over at Walt Kalistein's. He had a satellite dish. And, and I remember that McLean that played for New Jersey, he whistled one off the oh, right beside your yeah. head. And he said, Johnny oh, McLean. said, welcome to the NHL, McLean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, actually being out there was interesting because I remember the first shot on net hits the crossbar and goes in the upper deck from Johnny McLean. And so as a young athlete, you go from that, all that work to make it to the NHL, and then you fast forward to what happened next. You know, I was up and down between the NHL and the minors, so my my next game in the minors, I'm playing against Peoria and um, Tony Twist and what happened. So um, when did you first hear about what happened in that game when I got checked from behind? Like, was it a phone call from me or how, would, how did that all happen? Somebody from the hockey team, the management called and they wanted us to bring down x-rays from the Strathroy Hospital because they thought your neck was broke. Uh, and. Uh, so we gathered him up and, and, and drove down the rest of the night and we really got down there in the morning and uh, that's basically how that went out. But you were out of hockey for quite a while and that's, after that when you come back, uh, quite a bit of your concentration, you'd have good game and another one not so good and mm -hmm. it was hard to focus. But at that time you and Dominic Hasek were we're one, two in that uh, international league, or yeah, in, the NHL, in, yeah. and uh, and we all know what Hasek did. So to, to be one, two with him, it, it don't come to many higher standards than that. No, he it, went on to do. All he was an amazing goalie, and it's that was sort of one of the things where you look back and you you wonder what could have happened because we didn't know about head injuries then. And we didn't know the long-term effects. And the one thing that I do know when I when I tried to recover from all that stuff was I wasn't seeing the puck as well. So you create a catch-22. You don't see it as well, so you get hit in the head more. 
and it just keeps building and building. And back then, you didn't want to get out of the lineup because of a, you know, you got a headache or something. You, you just stayed in there and tried to be tough. And now we know what a mistake that is because of, of that damage. But at the end of the day, I, I want to pick your brain on one last question. So if you had to give some advice to a parent of a kid playing hockey now, um, what would that be? And prefacing that by saying, I was very proud to have you as my father during that period because you never car coached me. You never told me to work hard. You never um, were on me about what bad goals I, were, I was letting in. You'd always say like, good game, or how about that, or bad game. It was never really given it to me, um, which I know a lot of kids go through. So. If you could say anything to the parents of kids that are trying to make it right now, what would you say as a parent, how can you best help that kid get to where they need to go? Just be with them and, and don't belittle them if, if they let in a soft goal or something. And my number one motto with Steve was, just think that there's a, a, a scout in the crowd looking at you in every game even in practice, think that there's a scout there. You look up in the crowd, you can't tell one, whether it's a scout or just a guy with a notepad. And uh, my number one thing would be play as if you think they're there to scout you. And that was great advice because I remember as a young kid imagining even in the morning practice, there'd be nobody in the arena, I'd visually create a guy up in the crowd and I'd play to him all the time. And, I remember I got off to a good start at Miami of Ohio against Michigan, and then the next night, next weekend, we're playing against Michigan State, and there's 20 scouts there watching me, and I'm like, well, I've been playing for you guys all along. So I didn't have to try any harder or do anything differently because I've been prepping for them. So um, I'm going to let you back to take care of Mom, and she's had some recent surgery. So thanks for coming out today okay. for the interview. And um, It's amazing to have somebody come from a small town like Naren to make it to the big leagues in racing. and. I think I use that as an example because coming from Strathroy, nobody really played in the NHL as a goalie at that point. And um, your work ethic of working one, two jobs all the time is something that you didn't have to tell me to work hard. You gave me an example that I could follow and I think that's probably the best advice parents could have. Lead by example instead of trying to push your kid with respect to how hard you should be working. And back to that, don't be coaching the kids on the way home what you should have did and what you shouldn't do. No that, question. You, you can put put somebody's spirits down and it just doesn't end there. That stays with them. Yeah, you're not going to get your kid to the NHL by saying the right word at the right time. The, the kids normally have the work ethic. You, you have to have the ability, but then everything has to fall in line. No question. All right, Dad, thank you very much. Good. Great interview. I got these Visual Edge glasses sent to me, 3D glasses. There's an online program where you can work on your vision, your hand-eye convergence, all this cool visual acuity stuff. Um, to be upfront, I tried them in about 20 seconds, gave myself a migraine, and that has to do likely with my history with um, concussions and detached retinas, that little thing. So my results obviously vary. Uh, I think it's a good idea as a warm-up. I think it's a good idea if you've got nothing better to do, meaning work on your recoveries, your positioning, all that other stuff. Um, I'm not going to say it's a gimmick because I didn't test it, but I'm just going to tell you, um, I think what they're advertising, the program they're doing would likely help you get um, feeling better about your reflexes and feeling better about your hand-eye coordination. And I'm sure there's some psychosomatic growth that goes into it, but there's actually no empirical evidence that these improve anything. Um, I can't really comment on them beyond, I think they look cool. And I'm sure they'll help um, softball players and um, people that have to look at projectiles as the core part of their job. But as we talked about with proportional training, goaltending is very minimally about watching the projectile. Yeah, it's a huge thing in making saves. But like we've said, in a 40 save game, you're only spending 40 seconds stopping the puck. So I wouldn't spend a huge proportion of your time thinking this is going to get you to the NHL. I think they're another cool idea, another cool device, another thing you can do when you got nothing to better do to grow your game. But for me, I love this product for that purpose. 
don't know. Is that a good review? Not a good review? Who knows?